Welcome back to another episode of the Say It Out Loud podcast. I'm your host, Vasavi Kumar. Uh, very excited to have Judy Holler on the podcast today. Judy Holler is the author of the book, Fear is My Homeboy. She is also the host of the podcast, Yes. And um, she left her corporate job in Chicago a few years ago, took the leap and turned her passion for improv and storytelling into her career. Love this woman already. Now she's an entrepreneur, best-selling author and keynote speaker. As the CEO and founder of House of And, her improv background has accelerated her to a multitude of stages, helping individuals and teams at companies like Four Seasons, Bank of America, and T-Mobile, to name a few, to expand their possibilities and eliminate someday syndrome to make their someday today. So I'm super excited to be uh, showing you, inviting you into our conversation today. Uh, so here we go. Let's welcome Judy Holler to the Say It Out Loud podcast. Okay, Judy, thank you so much for being here on the Say It Out Loud podcast. How the hell are you today? I'm doing good. And since this is called the Say It Out Loud podcast, I've got to laugh at us. Like we were literally just talking about my last name. And isn't that a Say It Out Loud last name? Like, holla. Judy, welcome holla. Judy. Holla to the show. Okay, well, so I'm going to do this. I always like, I always want to make sure that people know right away because I know that by the end of this episode, they're going to be like, I want to get to know Judy. I want to follow her. I'm, you know, you know, maybe curious about her mentorship program. So just like out the gate, I just want people to know right away because you know, when people are listening to podcasts, they're like, oh my God, I already like and love this person. How can people find you? I just like to get that out of the way. It's like, yes, go, go connect with her. How can they find you on uh, Instagram yeah. website? Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for that. Yeah. Cool guys. If you, um, you know, have fun with us here today, I'd love to hang out with you on any of the social. Uh, I think Instagram is where I hang out the most. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm at Judy Holler, J U D I Holler, H O L L E R on the gram. You gotta and say it like I that. <laughs> you gotta say it like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Judy Holler is the website. And then, you know, my lifestyle brand really rooted in improv, which is what we're going to talk about today. That improv, the mm -hmm. magic of the improv theater mindset. Set. It, my lifestyle brand is called House, H A U S of and A N d.com and we have a monthly mentorship and um all kinds of really great stuff and our our, our t-shirts on the front of our shirts um we have a big old ampersand because see in the improv theater the first thing and this is a good segue yeah so like i can't wait to hear what you think about this so in yeah. the improv theater have you have yes. you taken improv? Okay, yes. yes and I have. Done it. Okay. Yeah. So in the improv theater, the first thing we learn, literally in any improv school across the United States and beyond, okay, the first piece of training you're going to get in most cases is the concept of yes and, right? So we say yes to agree because guys, improv means you have no script, right? It's not stand up comedy. It's not a memorized monologue. We get suggestions from the audience and then we use improv uh, training to succeed on stage without said script. So yes, sand is a tool. So we would say, okay, great. We get a suggestion and then we go, yes, thank you for that awesome suggestion. And here's what I'm gonna add to it. But here's the thing, and this is why I am so into the transformative power of and. It is really the work I'm currently doing and it's the heartbeat of the house of and because I believe, yes, throughout life, there's books about it, there's movies about it. Say yes, say yes, say yes. I don't know if it's enough because how many times have you seen teams, companies, movements, projects, stop it. Yes. How many times have you stopped it? Yes. Like yes can be a stop sign mm. if you're not brave enough to like go do something with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and is the movement, it's the doing, it's the action, it's the momentum that's actually going to get you what you want. Like think of it this way. Yes. Is basically Robin and and is Batman, right? Like I think and is the star because without it, nothing's going to change. And that really is why I believe yes isn't enough. So I'm really on this mission to disrupt yes and to make and the star. And, and that's what we do in the house of and, and we use the improv mindset to help people rethink that, figure out a different relationship with their fear and just really make shit happen. So I just have to say I'm on day three, day two of my period. And before I got on here, 
Before I got on a good episode, yeah. let's well, go. I just want to say the power of yes and I'm already seeing it. First of all, your energy is infectious. Like I thought I was energetic. It's like shit. You, you I have love me. your energy too. No, but I'm on day two of my period. I'm wearing a long ass maxi pad and I'm like, oh my God, kill me. I wasn't going to reschedule, but I was just like, oh, I'm feeling like, you know how it okay. is. Like, yes. And I just want to say thank you so much because even as you were talking about yes and, so I, I look at, I pay attention to words and how they feel in my body, right? So yeah. I noticed when, when I heard you say yes, my chest opened up. But then when you said mm. and, it like opened up even more. Like it was like yes was like the first step. Yes is great. Yes is great. But and is like whoosh. Like I felt this expansion of my chest. So I just want to let you know I'm back. I'm here. I'm <laughs> see, see what I'm saying. It is, yeah. it's an invitation. Mm -hmm. It is, it is play. It is exploration. It is possibility. It is literally this, this beautiful opening of like, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like truly my whole story with the improv theater. I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but like when I first signed up for improv classes, like, I don't know about you, but I was a little older in the game. I was mm -hmm. 30 years old when I took my first ever improv. And what a lot of people don't know, like I signed up for level A, level A basic <laughs> improv. Okay. And basic bitch improv. Yep. <laughs> sign me up. Right. Like that was what I took. Okay. And so I was like single, new to Chicago, trying to figure it out, had no friends. And I'm like, great. I know I need to meet people. That's my yes. I know I need to put myself out there. That's my yes. And okay, babe, what are you going to do about it? So my mm -hmm. and was great. I'm going to go take an improv. So I sign up, pay the fee. It was non-refundable. And I walked all the way there and I never went in. I lied when people asked me if I was lost. I legit chickened out. Wow. So my fear and I know your listeners are going to relate to this. I mean, I know in your story, you've yeah. had these moments, right? So just reading your about page on your website, I'm like, yep, there's an and moment. There's an and moment. There's mm -hmm. an and moment. Oh, there's a door closed. There's a door open. Mm -hmm. So I was so afraid at 30 that I was an ancient fossil. Like I thought I was so old. I thought, what am I doing? All these kids and everybody's going to make fun of me. And it took me like two years, almost two years to go back. And, you know, there's this slide I show in my keynotes. I work primarily as a keynote speaker and it shows my first ever improv ensemble when I finally went back and opened the door two, two years later. And I highlight Shelly and Frank. Like, so the first woman I saw legit when I opened the door sitting on the chair, the little folding chair was a woman named Shelly, who was at the time 55 years old, improv professor, taking improv to like better connect with her. Well, just a professor at University of Chicago. She wasn't an improv professor. Mm -hmm. I misspoke there, but she was taking improv to become, you know, a more confident presenter and to connect mm -hmm. with her students. And then Frank was the sales guy. He was 53 years old, taking improv to like be a better presenter. And I had been waiting for almost two years. So like that moment, like of quitting on myself and allowing fear to make the decision. Um, and then me opening the door and realizing that Oh my God, everything was actually on the other side of that door. I mean, certainly my life as I now know it, like I opened the door of that improv classroom to like meet people and to just figure out improv. And it literally turned into, you know, that's the great thing about doors. That's the great thing about opening them. And that's the great thing about, and is because it leads you to your next yes. Like literally opening the door was like, oh shit, now I've got a book and a business and here we are in a podcast and I speak on stages and like the things have just started happening because I had the guts and the courage to bet on myself and open the door to say yes. And okay, babe, what are you going to do about it? But we don't do that enough. We, we get stuck at, at, at yes, you know, and, and we wonder why things aren't changing. So, you know, that's, why I've become obsessed with doors and opening them and finding the keys it's going to take to open said door, because sometimes the key is going to be your foot. Sometimes you need to pick the lock. Sometimes you need to bust the door down, but we got to get through that door because what's on the other side is really that freedom you want and the fun, by the way, you know, and because then you find your next yes. And you're like, shit, we're off to the races again. So I, I want to piggyback off what you said about the fun, because, you know, when I, I'm talking to a woman like you and I can feel your energy and I can feel your fun. This is not manufactured. I can tell that this energy yeah. that you're bringing to this interview has come from many yes ands and it's come yeah. from many uh, opportunities and situations where you have walked through that door because the type of energy that you have, which is contagious, I believe can only come from within and you not quitting on yourself 
and you walking through that door, even if it took you two years, even if, even, even if it took you two years to go back, you still went back. You know what yeah. I mean? So I just, I, I would love to kind of go into like why, not why, why people quit on themselves, but it's like for people who have a tendency to quit on themselves. And I know what this is as someone who's in recovery uh, over three years from cocaine. I relapsed. I had relapsed before that. And I remember when I quit on myself, I remember where I was at, if I want to use that languaging. But wh what was it for you, those two years that like, so like you went, you lied about it. I've done that. Too. I've done yeah. that. And I'm like, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, because there was so much shame around like, oh, I'm too much of a chicken. So I'd have to lie about it. And then like, what what made you go back? I'm just like, what, 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 what happened? Cause like, I love my audience to hear this. Like, okay, just because you have a moment where you chicken out because it happens, our nerves get the best of us. It doesn't mean that you have to shut that door forever. So what, what snapped or switched inside of you for you to decide, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go back. Even yeah. though it's been two years. What, what, what happened? Mm. Yeah. Great question. So here's the thing. I needed some new keys. So Old keys won't open new doors. Mm -hmm. Oh, new keys. But new, mm -hmm. yeah, but new doors are the key to a better life. And I think a lot of us assume that you have to be confident. Oh, she must be, you must be so confident. That's why you opened the door. That's why you went back. That's why you did it. Actually, it was the opening. So from the time I quit on myself, to the time I went back, there was two years in between. And in those two years, I had to go get myself some new keys because I had a lot of old keys, a lot of limiting beliefs. There's this great story about a baby elephant that is tied uh, and tethered to this fence. OK, so it grows up into this big, beautiful, gargantuan elephant with a big trunk and beautiful hooves and like all the magic that an elephant is. And it grows up and it's big and strong and it's um, still tethered to this fence because it's been tethered to this fence its whole life. And so it just assumes that's its story. That's its life. Like I'm this elephant and I am tethered to this fence. The elephant has no idea that it has grown up and it is big and it is strong. And now it could easily break away from the fence. So I ask you, like, what are you tethered to? What is the fence? And I had to reckon with that. I spent mm -hmm. two years building confidence by doing new things, doing hard things, proving to myself I can live to talk about it, which gave me the confidence to go back two years later. So I say to you, number one, you need new keys. So maybe those keys are a th great therapist. Maybe it's a good supportive group of friends. Maybe you got to double down and read a lot of extra Brene Brown or listen to a little more Beyonce, like whatever it's going to do for you, get an ensemble together, get some keys, get some new keys, get clear on mm -hmm. what those limiting beliefs are that you're tethered to. Mine was the I'm too old key or the I'm not funny enough key or the everybody's going to make fun of me key or the I won't belong here key, right? All that bullshit I thought, you know, about myself and my circumstances. So I had to go do things to prove to myself otherwise. So coming back to confidence, we don't need confidence to go do new hard things. It's the doing new hard, hard things, things that makes you more confident. Yeah. So if you want to open the door and you're nervous, go get proof, go build, go run the drills, mm -hmm. run the reps, get people in your squad, read the right things, uh, consume a different type of content, you know, get yourself uh, where you want to be. Even if, you know, the people love to say like, oh, fake it till you make it. Like mm -hmm. why fake it? Be you now, because it's not going to get any easier. Uh, we got to make it until we make it. And that includes, um, putting ourselves out there way before we're ready. So that's kind of how I did it. I just ran the reps for two years. So I started building some confidence. I started like meeting people and real and like reading a lot of Brene Brown and listening to a lot of the right people and podcasts. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? No. Yeah. No, no more. I am done with my own bullshit, right? Like I'm done and I am smart enough and I am worthy and I do light up a room and I bring great energy and, yeah. you know, fuck, this could change my life. So let's go play. And if it doesn't, let's move on. At right? least, at least, at least you could, 
like I love what you said about proving it to yourself because it's not yeah. about anybody else. Like, yeah. who are you actually competing with? Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's you and you. So I love that you said that. So here we are two years later, you walking through the door, you're doing the thing, the improv thing. So I'd love to ask you, well, I, I have my answer to this, but I want to ask you, you know, when it comes to the women inside my Say It Out Loud group, my clients, we talk all about, you know, their confidence on camera. You know, I used to be a former TV host. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, and I, and it, it was nerve wracking. Like live television is nerve wracking because it's like, it's not just what you're saying, it's the prompter, it's the producer in your ear, it's all the things. And so one of the things that I love talking about is how do you handle your nerves? Because I think people feel that sensation in their body. So I just take a beta blocker, that shit helps me. <laughs> Just, I just reduce my blood pressure and I'm like, oh, I'm basically kind of dead on the inside. But hey, here we are. No, I'm just kidding. It does work for me, though. Like, like even before interviews, I get I get um, I get excited and my blood pressure goes up and then I like I'm not thinking straight. It just happens. So I, I mean, I have many tools. One of them is I take a beta blocker when I know it's like a like my nerves get take over. Right. And yeah. there are all sorts of different ways. There's no right or wrong way. It's what works for you. I'm curious to know whether you're right here on an interview or you're getting up on stage and doing a keynote talk or you're getting on camera because I went on your Instagram you're very you're very on camera same thing with me I love it yes. how and it's just practice it's practice you become better with practice you know so how do you handle your nerves what are some of the tips even to this day and I want my audience to hear that Judy you still get nervous am I am I correct oh yeah the, yes. you never trust a speaker yeah. or a performer that says they're not nervous yeah, because bullshit. for the hills it's yeah. bullshit yeah um I think it's the, the nerves remind me that I'm alive and it shows mm -hmm. that I care and that I respect my audience but there, there's this great thing Mel Robbins says like I love that you asked this question because we are so cut from the same cloth I mean we mm -hmm. do a lot of you know I was a radio television major in okay. college right so I I initially when I was in um, grade school, I wanted to be, uh, I can't even believe I'm going to say this. I wanted to be Debbie Gibson. Um, and then I was, so I'm telling you my age, I'm 46 years old. And then in my twenties, I wanted to be downtown Julie Brown. Like I oh. wanted to be an MTV VJ. That was all I wanted to do. And then, oh yeah, first, actually it was Katie Couric. College was Katie Kirk, then it was MTV VJ in like my late 20s. And um, now in my 40s, I realized all I really need to fucking do is be me and, and the rest is history. So um, I love that we share this. And there's there's a couple points of advice that I would give. Number one, um, Mel Robbins has famously said um, this about nerves and excitement. They are the, your brain doesn't mm -hmm. know the difference, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're backstage, you're about to go live on a podcast, you're about to film that Instagram reel, whatever it is you gotta do for your business and yourself and your job. You can literally say, instead of, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. You can be like, I am so excited, I am so excited, I'm so excited, even though you're nervous. And oh, by the way, so you can like Jedi mind trick your brain a little bit there. But honestly, yo, once you get, this is why and, and momentum is so important. Once you say, yes, I'm nervous, and you do it anyway, you put your feet on the stairs, you go live, you do whatever it is you're in too deep with the momentum that it yeah. just, don't you think like you go on camera yeah, and you'd be like, Oh, I'm, I'm just in it for 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, I'm just I'm, up here. And the, I, I love that. I love the switch. And, and everyone, you know, I'm a huge fan of saying it out loud, talking out loud to yourself. You're not crazy. The most intelligent Whoa. people in the world talk out loud. My, like my entire book. And for those of you who are not on the wait list, vasavikumar.com forward slash wait list on that list, get on the say it out. But it's so true though. Like, you say, I'm so excited. I love that I'm so, you could even say, I mean, what do you think of this? I'm so nervous and I'm so excited. Like, why can't you say both? Why can't you acknowledge both? Yes. Yes. Like gratitude. Like, yeah. absolutely. And gratitude for mm -hmm. the gift of being able to do work you love. If that's what you want to do in the world, the gratitude of being able to serve one person in that audience. I always say thank you mm -hmm. before I get on stage. And oh. then I tell myself I love myself. Like, because no matter what happens up here, this is why, I mean, chapter one of my book is called Love Yourself, because let me tell you, at the end of the day, if that doesn't work, like if you don't work, none of it matters. I could fall off a stage. I could bomb. I could have five resting bitch faces in the front row. And I don't, I know I'm going to get off that stage mm -hmm. and be cool with myself because I've done that work. And that's the most important work. So I think running the reps, um, you know, talking to yourself. And then I think, you know, because you get more confident in the doing of it right but I think the biggest thing for me truly comes back to the improv mindset I think the big misnomer about us improvisers 
because people say this shit to me all the time. They're like, oh, girl, you're an improviser. Well, you just wing it, right? You're cool. If all the tech goes down or you don't need anything for this, po-, which I love not having scripts for podcasts because it feels really authentic. But, you know, people are always like, oh, you're good. You'll wing it. You're, you're an improviser. I'm like, well, hold up. I am an improviser. So that makes me really flexible and mm-hmm. adaptive, right? And I don't panic because I have a set of tools. But the misnomer is that improvisers, because we know anything can happen at any second, we are some of the most prepared people mm-hmm. you ever meet. So you better bet your bottom dollar that before I get on a show, like I have spent the morning looking at you. Mm-hmm. I got to follow you on the gram too. I'm going to do that when we get off the, the <laughs> air. I know a little bit about you, right? I got my head in the game. I thought through like, okay, if I could give her audience value, what are the three things I'd love to get on the air and talk about today? When I'm on a talk, I have rehearsed it hundreds of times, right? I have a printed notes in case my all the tech goes down, which it's happened. I have my laptop. Like I have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C so that I can get up there and go, okay, like if I lose all power on the stage, it has happened to me. Like I can still deliver a talk. If my keynote, my slides go down, can I still deliver this talk? And so it's running the reps. It's making sure I'm rehearsed. It's, it's preparing. Um, and, and a lot of people that's a lost art people wing it. And then they wonder why they're not booked or they wing it. And they wonder why they're not making sales. Like we've all been in these sales presentations Mm -hmm. where you're looking at the person going, do you fucking even know my name? Like, do you, did you do any research here? Like, you know what I mean? So preparation is my secret weapon. Like I take it real seriously. So that's, that's great that you just said preparation. I want to share what my voiceover teacher, her name is Lainey. She's like in her sixties. I love her. I just left the recording studio today because we're recording my demo reel. So she have a great voice, by the way, are you going to do your audio book? I am. We, we signed. We signed for that. I we my, my agent negotiated that in the contract because I'm like I'm teaching people how to talk to themselves and I'm giving them scripts. I have to be the one to do it. Gotta Thank do you it. so much. It's it's 25 years of smoking. I don't smoke anymore. But <laughs> I used to smoke too. Yeah. I was one of those girls. Same. Yeah. I yeah. started smoking when I was 12. I turned 40, and right before I turned 40, it's been a year since I've actually August is going to be a year since I've touched. I'm it. so proud of you. It is Thank so you. hard to quit smoking. Like yeah. so hard because it's. Uh, I mean, and now we're talking about smoking, and that's totally fine. But I was a closet smoker so I never smelled like it I never smoked in my house never smoked in my car it was like an at-home thing but it was like yeah I could smoke a half a pack a day for sure anyway what I want to talk about preparation another podcast episode (laughs) it's another yeah why you stop smoking um my voiceover teacher always says proper preparation prevents piss poor performance and I proper preparation prevents piss poor performance and I I wrote down here let's change our relationship to practice so really quick story Judy as a child you know I come from uh an immigrant background I'm a first generation Indian immigrant my mom and dad have excellent work ethic I mean I know how to work because of them I you know anytime we I would hit a wall my mom would be like no you're gonna bust your head through that wall you're not gonna chip away at it you're gonna get to the other side of that wall you're gonna figure it out and so I I um how do I want to say this? I resisted practice because discipline and practice for me felt really like if I didn't get it right, my mom would get very annoyed at me. And so as a child, I learned how to take shortcuts. I was very good at finding the route. Like, ooh, how do, what's the quickest way? As I got older in my acting, in my voiceover, even in my speaking or even preparing, I was like, I don't want to wing it. And I realized the reason why I winged it for me on a much deeper level is because I didn't truly value what I had to say. So I didn't put in the effort. It wasn't because I was lazy. It wasn't because I was just some arrogant entitled like, oh, I'm so amazing. I'm going to wing it. It's because I did not truly value what I had to say and what I brought to the table until I started to value myself and increase my self-worth, which has really been my journey in the past two years, really increasing my self-worth. That's when I really started to value my practice and my preparation time. Like, even um, even like when I have to memorize lines for an acting class, like I schedule it in my calendar. Yes. 20 minutes, memorize it. Like it's, it's, it's not just, oh, I'll find the time. No, I freaking make the time. So yes. I would love to ask you about just like your, your take on 
preparation and practice because we do live in a society where everything is so quick and people have forgotten the lost art of like sitting your ass down, shutting off all distraction and just you being one with yourself and your art, whatever that looks like. So can you talk to us and walk us through like, how do you make it a ritual? How, how do we bring back the fun in practice again? Because yeah. I think so many of us are traumatized from school, by the way. <laughs> We yes. are stand up and read for the class and yeah. then everybody's snickering at you or yeah. you know, line up and yeah, a hundred percent. We're like forced into it. Yeah. 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 Um, damn, this is a really dope question. Um, you just said a bunch of things I really love Sorry. And, I really, <laughs> and I really love the perspective you bring on like why, you know, I could relate to the whole valuing yourself and your content. Like when we don't like, that's literally what you're doing. Like, you're saying to yourself, like, mm -hmm. when you do not put in the work, when you do not rehearse, when you do not schedule time to really put care behind the things that matter to you, you're literally saying, well, I don't care about myself. Yeah. Like, I'm shit. I don't have value. So I'm not going to give myself any attention here. That is an interesting um, way to really look at it. And it should make you feel bad about not putting time on your schedule to, to, to get better at your craft, because all you're doing, all you're doing is telling yourself that you're not worth it. Like yeah. your message isn't worth it. You're not good enough. Right. And those are fences we're tethered to. So I would dig into, you know, where are those limiting beliefs coming from? Why are you telling yourself? Why are you telling yourself those stories? And, you know, how do you release yourself? Well, you release yourself by, saying, yep, I clearly keep putting this off. I'm not making the time to rehearse. And I have done that. It's not easy to rehearse for a talk. You sit in your room and you talk to a wall for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> and right? then you judge yourself. It's just basically, well, hopefully you don't judge yourself. And, and hopefully I would love to ask you like with this process of improv and all the work that you've done, when you're, when you make a mistake, when you fumble, when you're like, how do you be with yourself? Or how did you used to be? Yeah. Versus how are you now? Are you gentler with yourself through the creative process? A hundred percent. So first part of the question is how do I prepare by doing just what you said? I schedule, I make the time, I schedule the time because every time I do that, I'm saying I am worthy. I am enough. This, this matters. This is my career. I take it seriously. And, um, that's the differentiator because yeah. I know a lot of people aren't, aren't putting in that work. Mm -hmm. So if you do put in that work, you will rise to the top one to 5% in your industry. So got to put in the work. So scheduling the time. And then when things don't go according to plan, mm -hmm. when I mess up, when I don't have a perfect moment, when things don't go my way, um, whether it's on stage or on a video, my gosh, I have, oh my God, there's this great quote by Amy Poehler. And I really think it is like, when I get asked like, what's the secret to your success? And I hate the word success because it looks different to everybody. But I'm like, yo, you want to know what my secret to success is? Two things. Number one, Amy Poehler says this quote. She goes, there is so much power in looking silly and not caring that you do. And I think as women, like Gilda Radner was beautiful at this, right? A Polar's great at this. Tina, Fe like these women who have this beautiful ability, um, Kristen Wiig, uh, you know, Molly Shannon, you know, they, they, they have this ability to um, look silly, not care that they do. And it empowers the women watching them to do more of the same. So if I fall, <laughs> fall off a stage or mess up an improv, scene, which you can't break improv because it's all made up anyway. You know, it's about calling, owning it in the moment, calling it out in the moment and saying, see, the great thing is I do work on improv so I can go see life is improv. Mm -hmm. Like I have two choices to make here. I can run off the stage and pretend like it didn't happen. Or I could say, awesome. What did I learn? Because you're either going to win or you're going to learn, but you don't lose. And a lot of people don't have that mindset, right? Like I know that no matter what I do, I am going to win, which is a lot of fucking fun. Yeah. Or I'm going to learn, which is a lot of fucking fun, because that means you're going to get to the next thing a lot faster. But so many of us are obsessed with having the best thing, being perfect, being great. And the improv theater teaches us, nope, that's not what it's about. 
It's about the next thing. It's about how am I moving it forward? How am I making her look awesome? How am I adding to the scene? How am I ending this? Remember, yes isn't enough. So yes, you could have a perfect speech, but if you're not willing to take risks, if you're not willing to put in the work, if you're not willing to rehearse it, if you're not willing to uh, add a new story or revamp your slides or write a new talk eventually, like you're going to just do the same things you've always done, right? So it's about innovation and practice and prep and of course um running the reps so that you can build the confidence required to keep doing it but yeah like that's the name of the game just just keep moving trust yourself and um know that success is really all about um being cool with getting it wrong so that you can get closer to getting it right and then of course my other secret to success is I've had so much help right I've asked for help I've had so many incredible um people I've asked for help and I've gotten help. And I think um, that is a big part of the story. No one ever, like, look, you think of your book, you think of all the things you're doing, your TV career, you could probably count five to eight people that have mm -hmm. helped you, opened a door, and I can guarantee you've probably asked for it. Like, hey, could you make an introduction? Or hey, can you give me a chance? Hey, I've got this great book idea. Hey, so it's a combination of being brave enough to ask and then also surrendering to the support of other people who've been there before you. Well, learning to receive, well, learning to ask and, and learning and receive, like I've actually, the asking part is, has come very naturally, maybe because I'm the youngest. I've always, I mean, like I've just, I was the youngest in the family. I always had to ask for help for everything. You're like, hey guys, see me over here. Hey, hello, hello. I exist. So asking has never been actually my issue. It's the receiving. It's like yeah. once someone's willing, it's like, oh wait, really? And then now I feel bad. Now yeah. I feel bad, but I mean, I would still take the help, but I'd always feel like, are you going to hold this over my head? So I've been working on that. I've been working yeah. on the, the belief that like there are just like I like to give, there are people in this world who are, you know, just walking gods who just want to help me. We're all, all of us human beings are just some version of God wanting to help one another. Why should I turn away? Like I know how good it feels to help somebody, right? hundred percent. It feels so good. And so one of the shifts in my head, and I want my audience to hear this, I don't want to rob anyone else of that experience of giving to me because I know how good it feels to give to someone. It feels so good to give with no attachment simply because I want to. So that's actually helped me to learn how to receive is that you I think I love this. I love that you're bringing that up. I have this really bad habit. I can relate to you so much. And my team calls me out on it all the time. So let me give you an example. Someone will say, and I'm good about like, if someone goes, Oh my God, girl, I love your dresser. Oh my God. I love your hair. Oh my God. I will say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm really good about like receiving compliments. I'm getting better about that. It's when, so say for example, someone, this just happened the other day. Someone goes, well, I was, we were on a team call and she goes, well, I was on your website and I, you, what a great website. I just love your website. I was like, oh, well, thank you so much. But oh my God, the about me page or this page. And I started mm. deflecting or someone says, oh, I love your workbook. And you're like, oh, but my workbook, I did that in the pandemic. And it's this, like I downplay because mm -hmm. it's like, I'm a, like, like, it's almost like I'm in embarrassed it's like i'm embarrassed or it's like not good enough or it's 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 all ego right it's all ego and 99 percent of the time and my team's like it's the most annoying thing you do because no <laughs> one is thinking that like yeah. your website's incredible and your book is changing and your workbook is changing people's lives like well, stop that shit you know what i mean and yeah. since i'm with you like just receive what someone says take a deep breath and say thank you like i'll do it when someone comes to my house i'm like oh my god i love your new house i'm like oh but the curtains aren't up and then this and then blah, 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 blah. and it's like everyone's like exhausted right yes. because i've just like thrown up all over their compliment which is actually kind of rude you know if someone's giving you a compliment be accept it because you feel like shit when someone doesn't accept your compliment right i do i feel like you've just kind of thrown it back in my face like that was yeah. meant to be given to you so speaking of your book fear is my homeboy yeah i love that fear is my homeboy and then your workbook can you remind me is it fear boss it's the fear boss project yeah okay. so it was really um a request to add to that body of work because people read fear is my homeboy and then they're like we want more so it's really like a workbook that helps you um 
great for self-reflection. Uh, it, it's literally a col colorful workbook, but it can also be great for teams and, um, you know, uh, sales meetings, like give you different ideas to think about how you're remixing the courageous conversations you're having every day for yourself and with the people you work with and even in your book club. So it was just a, a, a supplement to, to what we were doing in Fierce, my homeboy. And my goodness, people have just been eating it up. So it was, a, and it was like a, you know, COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I needed all also an outlet and, and, you know, I was running on all cylinders as a keynote speaker and, you know, looking back at all of it, I'd love to know for you, like what your biggest perspective shift has been out of COVID. Like I know for me, like perspective for sure, but like, I am so glad I was almost like forced like into a brick wall because I look back at pictures of myself in like 2019 and I'm like, oh damn, I do not recognize that girl. Like I was losing my hair. I was, you know, I stopped drinking for a whole year because I mean, my shit was a mess, right? Like I was just on level 10, wasn't stopping irritable. I was on, got on antidepressants. Like this is all pre COVID girl. So COVID happens and I am like forced to sort of reckon with everything I've known, like keynote speaking defined me. And if I wasn't speaking, like who was I? And oh, by the way, how the fuck am I going to make money? Right. And so mm -hmm. all these things. So like sitting down for me, it really like it forced, it walked me into everything we have now, like house of and and really like cracking open the improv mindset because I used it to save my life. Truly. Like I, I say improv saves my life. It really does. Like this ability to adapt in extreme situations of disappointment and fear and anxiety is a powerful tool to have. I mean, you've walked through addiction. So you know it. Amanda on my team is seven years sober, drugs and alcohol. So we talk a lot about addiction. And I think you know, a lot of us, even those of us who have not walked through deep, deep addiction, I think we all felt we are all feeling the PTSD of COVID, but also we all had to reckon, I think really reckon with ourselves. And I took away um, the fact that like, I feel no guilt anymore about saying I'm a lot quicker with my nose. I know how fast, like how precious time is and I'm quicker with my nose where I wasn't. And so that's why I was losing my hair and a hot mess in 2019 because I did everything. And I was so on the last of my own list. Now I do my, myself first. I'm like, great. Where am I in my day? And then I'll line everything else up behind that. Right. That was my shift. What about you? Like, how are you on the other side of COVID? Not to bring up COVID, but like, no, I am curious. It is what it is. Listen, I, I'm, I feel a little embarrassed admitting this, but I thrived during the pandemic. Lucky let me, girl. No, but let, let me, there. let me tell you why. I went back to rehab the second time, March of 2019. So by wow. the time March 2020 came around, I was a year sober. I basically quarantined myself in that first year of recovery, stopped hanging out with my Stopped hanging out with the people I was fucking with. Stopped going to the bar. Stop. So I quarantined myself. And I literally, I'm not kidding, Judy. I, oh my God. I Googled, how do I love myself? I oh, did babe. not know. I'm not kidding. That's yes. what, from 2019 to, I'm not Fuck saying 2020 yeah. was like, I got back together with a, uh, an ex. He wasn't a toxic ex. We were both toxic for each other, but he, I mean, so, so basically we were both toxic, but that's not the point. He wasn't like into drugs. <laughs> it's fine. It was, it was, you know, the sex was great. Yeah, I was horny. Kind of toxic. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of toxic, whatever. But, the, but, the, but, you know, God willing, I was, I was sober, right? So it's like before COVID, um, happened a year. I was already in quarantine. I was already sober. So I learned how to be with oh, myself. What a blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm not kidding. And when I Googled how to love, I feel, I've, I've, never, I've never shared this. I, I, I write about it in the book. I say, how do I love myself? And one of the first things that said was drink water first thing in the morning. So even to this day, I mean, I, and of course we logically know this, but like I was learning how do I love myself? Cause I was also single. So I had no drugs, no booze, no man. My entire identity and my way of coping was completely out the door. I wasn't anybody's boo. I was, I was, I, I just, I was at a broken engagement. I didn't have cocaine, didn't have alcohol. I smoked a lot of cigarettes, but other yeah. than that though, like I didn't know how to actually love myself. And so when COVID came about, I was okay. Like I was okay with being alone. Um, and I actually did a lot of virtual keynote speaking. So I made yeah, my money. Same, thank goodness. But, Saved me. 
Yeah, the the biggest thing that I've had to work on is my self-worth and my value and scheduling the, you know, time to work on my acting. Like I have a script right here for an acting class that I'm doing. Like I had to schedule the time to do that. Um that's what I would say. Like being lonely and being but being alone and having solitude is not something I'm scared of. Like my solitude is so amazing, Judy. <laughs> So it's like, yeah. I'm I'm very single right now. I'm consciously single. So my standard is like, listen, I love my solitude so much. So you need to match my solitude or be even better than my solitude. Because what I have right now is pretty damn good. I have a golden yeah. retriever. My golden retriever. I do too. Wait, I will, I'll show you after the show. She's literally passed out right there oh in front God. of me. I put him out there because they were barking. Because I, I, I knew a package was coming. I have a German and a golden. So we'll have to gush on that when we go. Yes, on. I have my Lainey. She's 12 years oh, old. She's obsessed. Yeah. Yeah, no, she's and and I saw you have a golden retriever named Tito. Tito, yes, yes, yes. yeah. La La Lainey's just. I I'll show you afterwards. But anyway, yeah, COVID was. Um, it was. I think it was rough for everybody. Um, we had a we had a snow apocalypse in uh, Texas where we couldn't flush our yeah. toilets. I mean, that was a thing. But overall, I think. Um, well, I you know what I love. I I'm so glad I asked you because you gave such an honest badass answer that I really hope your listeners, I can guarantee someone can relate to that. I mean, the chap first chapter of my book is called love yourself. Mm -hmm. The fact that you like, I think people will be shocked to know that someone like you who has overcome and gone through and has been on television and like your story and being Indian and just everything you have had to deal with it that you didn't know how to love yourself like are you kidding me and the fact that someone like you it, literally googled how to love myself and the second part about it is, so number one, ladies and gents, whoever's listening right now, you, Q Michael Jackson's, you are not alone because you are not alone. Number one. Number two, the fact that it can be as simple, I think we overcomplicate it all. Getting enough water every day is it's as simple as prioritizing that in your life, right? It, I think so many of us assume that like self-love is like, okay, I've got to rent a cottage in the woods and I've got to sit with the Zen Buddha. Oh, I, wait, mm -hmm. hold on. I need a, I need a shaman. Nope, nope, nope. I'm going to get a tattoo that says I love myself. No, I need to do I'm psychedelics. Gonna, I need to do, do a fucking I'm journey like, every weekend. Yeah. Like it doesn't, you don't need to do, it could just begin at the beginning. It could simply be a post-it note on your freaking bathroom, bathroom mirror every day that says, I love myself. And you have to look at that shit every day, right? It could look like, what is a limiting belief you need to break, right? The inverse of it, right? What is, here's another thing I love to do from a love yourself perspective. A lot of people, this, you got to steal this idea. This is a good one. So um, a lot of people like to talk about like, I am power statements. Okay. Like I am health. I am wealth. I am I'm a best-selling author. I am a main stage keynote. I am a top 1% podcast or whatever your dreams are. Okay. Um, that is powerful. And that is so good. Cause we want to do that. Cause we got to The way you talk to yourself matters, but if you want to put some and momentum behind it, okay. If you want to put some and juice behind it, you know, they got, there's a song called Nelly by Nelly called Pimp Juice. We're going to put some and juice on your I am power statements. Okay. And the and juice is how can I be wealthy? How can I be a best-selling author? How can I speak on stages? How can I be a top 1% podcaster? Now, motherfuckers, we have some action steps. Okay. Now we're getting wow. some work done. Now I can say, Ooh, how can I be a keynote speaker? I can brr, rattle off. Okay, wait, I, I want to do it for me. Can we do it right now? Let's, let's workshop okay, it right now. Okay, okay, here's what I want. I am um, a star on a Netflix TV show. I okay. am, I'm a lead in a movie. And how can I is... I can get into the rooms of um, online workshops with casting directors. I can go to more networking events. I can go to film festivals. I can go to Sundance. I can go to there's Venice Film Festival. I can go to Austin Film Festival. I can get in touch with the executive director of Austin Film Fest, who I already know. I can reach out to fellow actors. Ooh, I can find out. I would love to be on Never Have I Ever, which has been produced by Mindy Kaling. Like, did you ever see Never Have I Ever? Uh, no, but I love Mindy Kaling. 
thank you so much, but I want to be like the older version of the girl that is the, is yeah. the main star. Like <laughs> I have been wanting to play her 40 year old version. Did you guys she... hear the energy here? Like yeah. look at what just happened to her. If you could see her face, yeah. like that is just the beginning. So now this is actually our methodology. So the first step is to say, yes, decide. I uh, am, you know, so yes, I want to be a star on a Netflix series. Great. Step two, how can I be a star on a Netflix series? Okay. She just rattled off a bunch yeah. of shit. The next step is, okay, we've got to, we've got to open our first door. So what are the keys I'm going to need to open that motherfucking door? Who do I need to meet? Who do I need to call? What courses do I need to take? What books do I need to read? Who can help me out? How can I put myself out there? And then once you do that, you then go through the first door. You take one thing from that list this is and pick it and go. And then guess what it does? It leads you to your next yes. Cause you're going to pick one of those keys, right? So you're going to have your yeses. You're going to have your, how can I's you're going to get a set of keys. You're going to take one of those keys, use it to open the door so you can go through it. Once you pick that first key and open that first door, it's going to lead you to your next. Yes. And we begin again. And then we say, great. I, I got um, a mentorship with, I actually got an internship with Netflix. So that's the first key I'm going to pick. I can go actually here, say, let's just do a fun improvised scenario here. Yes. I want to be on Mindy Kaling's show. I'm going to be the, the mom of Mindy Kaling's show. Mm -hmm. How can I? Great. One of the ways I can do that is getting an internship at Netflix. Right. So let's just say, cause Mindy's there every day. Okay. So great. So one of my keys is to get an internship. Great. You get the internship. You make a call. You get this internship. You go to the internship. Maybe you get there. So once you go through that door and you say, great, that's the key I'm plucking up. That's the internship I'm doing or wherever you're going to do at Netflix. You get there and you go, oh, there's this other opportunity that I didn't even know existed. And maybe I can have my own show that leads you to, yes, I am going to go down that rabbit hole. So great. How can I get my own show? How can I? And then we sort of begin in the next adventure. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is we can have a list of how can I's. We can have a set of keys we could use to open these new doors. But this is where improv comes in because we also have to surrender a little bit to what's mm -hmm. going to happen on the other side of the door because we don't have all the answers. Anything can change at any time. So the great thing about and is that yes, and can get you into new things, but it can also get you out of shit you don't want to be doing anymore. Mm. So if you can yes, and yourself into things, you can yes, and your way out of it. You could open the door to Netflix and go, whoop, uh, not what I wanted. There's That's a great. lot of crazy people here. So you just, whoop, yep, I don't like that. So how can I get out of here? What keys do I need to wow. get to get out of here? And then boom, what's that first door I'm going to open to get out of here, right? And so it's a four part. This is what we teach in our methodology. This is what my next book going to be all about this this idea we're calling it the transformational power of and how to unlock your potential and it's a, an algorithm that works every time i have to say i i've seen like i've heard a lot of formulas this is probably the one that hits home the most it makes i'm a lot i'm i'm very emotional but i'm also very logical right and i love this it's like i i am blah 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 how can i blah, blah, blah. And then what are the keys? And then I wrote down who, what, where, when, and why. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. So I wrote that. It's like, I love this. And for everyone, we'll put this in the show notes. And then also we will link to Judy's website so you can just follow her content. This is so good, Judy. I, I love the breaking down of things. You know, I was diagnosed with a- Me too. Yes, you love- <laughs> I, I do too. Well, my brain, I like things like I kind of need things. I'm a smart girl like you, but I like things spoon fed, but I'm also like, we can't assume. I think uh, people think improv means like, oh, you're just going to be reckless and you just fucking go with the flow. Like, no, no we actually have an algorithm. So I don't want to tell you what to think. I want to yeah. help you do think? your own answers yes. faster. It's yeah. like a, it's like a formula that helps you answer your own questions. So I get it. I get, I, I yes, I, I like a framework. I like to be able to take a notebook and write shit down and then say, okay, how can I back myself into this? Instead of some big philosophical idea, let's break it into something that's actually like juicy that I could teach someone else. If I can teach it to someone else, that's how I know I'm onto something. Yeah. It's not, you're not teaching me what to think. You're teaching me how no, to think. How to think. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Difference. So we're going to go, I want to be mindful of your time, but I want to go into the rapid fire section of our podcast, which I wanted to. The keep. improv section. The, the improv section. Yes. And I, you know what? I just thank you for your energy because I was like, how do I want to start this? But I'm glad we're going this route anyway. Yes. I'm so excited. Let's, let's keep it. Okay. <laughs> so here's the question. Okay. What's something you're loving these days? Say it out loud. 
What's something you're loving these days? I am loving the desert heat because I just moved to Arizona and everybody thinks it's crazy that we're here in the summer. And I have wanted to live here since like for a decade. So I'm loving the desert heat. I love being in Arizona. I'm in Scottsdale area. So beautiful. What's something that you can't stand? Say it out loud. Lazy motherfuckers. Why am I dropping so many motherfuckers on this podcast? Necessary. <laughs> Ladies and gents, when I get the permission to curse, you better watch what, what, out. Listen, when, when I say motherfucker, that's when you know it cuts deep. I literally it cut, said it a couple times. You said it three like, times and I loved it. I live for it. And you know what? I had someone on my Instagram. I put a post. I had a post that said, you are a goddamn genius. And someone said, I love the message. I hate that you're damning God. And I'm like, listen, oh, if that is okay. the only thing that you got from Just, my caption, you Just, got bigger you fish got to fry. Anyway, that's wrong place. That's what yeah, I can't so say. So lazy okay. people, lazy, lazy is tough for me. Yeah, same here. Um, what's something that has made you sad recently? Say it out loud. How much pressure I put on myself to be perfect. Yeah. Like social media is fucking with me. Like I hate, I'm so disappointed in myself and on, and how much I care about the likes and what everybody else is doing that I'm really working on boundaries there uh, because it's making me feel like I need to be something other than myself. And I hate that feeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on it. I understand. Yeah. You. you felt that one. I could tell you felt I, that one. I felt that. I'll tell you why, because I cleaned up my, who I was following. Um, yeah. because now that I, I'm kind of getting out of the coaching industry, I've been doing this for 11 years and I want more acting stuff in my, I want to see more yes. actors. I want, so I basically unfollowed everyone to get to zero. Then I started following people. I think I followed you. I got to follow you. But like oh people that I've actually connected with, people that I actually want to see in my in your feed, world. Act, I, I follow like marketing for actors, casting opportunities, like stuff that I want, like nice houses or vacations and stuff this about love. This is a great tip. I hope everybody's hearing this. I once heard somebody say, think of your Instagram as a museum yeah. and you are curating a collection of art. So what is the art you're looking at every day? Does it piss you off? Does it irritate you? Is it ugly? Ugly? Is it toxic? Is it competitive? Is it make you jealous? Like get new art in your museum. And I thought that was a beautiful way. I'm going to take your advice and I'm going to go do a, I, I okay, no, well, hold, my art. Hold on. This ties into what makes you sad because what I re well, they, because of that, my engagement is low. So I've now followed back like a hundred like people that I actually want to follow. But whereas I would get a hundred likes on something, I'm getting 25, I'm getting 35. Makes you feel like a piece of crap. But yes. I, and I notice that, but it's the same. I want to share this with everyone. It's the same practice that I do with my money. I look at my bank account every day. I look at yeah, the yeah. number and I ask myself, how does this number make me feel? Whether it's 30,000, 3,000, whatever it is, uh, my job is to feel neutral. I don't yeah. want a fucking number to fuck with me. I, I cannot. It. Like, are I you cannot. Like, how is that any better than, than having drugs fuck with you or having right. an ex? Like, it's the same shit. Like, I want to be impenetrable. I yeah. do not want to look at a number and say, I must suck or, oh, 25 likes. Oh, I must only be 25% worthy or whatever the fuck. Mm. Like, so I want to say I relate because I, I removed every, I went down to zero for a week and then I said, okay, I'm ready to start bringing back things into my life. So now I'll look at my feed. And so I was looking at a lot of like anxious attachment stuff because I, I've identified with anxious attachment. I start stop following it because I go, I'm not going to identify with this anymore. Right. I don't want to look at anxious attachment. You're sending those signals. No, I love it. I'm not. That's I don't. So I don't true. need to identify with anxiety. It does not need to be no. a core part of my identity. I right. get it and I understand it, and I and I can uh, uh, accept that I have traits, but I don't right. want it in my fucking face. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I love it. Okay, so next question. Um, I love this. What is something so amazing about yourself? Like, you know when the top is down and you're listening to 90s hip hop, like, you know, yeah. when you're just on fire and you're, your nails are done, your hair is done, or even that, maybe your hair is not done. Maybe you have a beautiful iced coffee and you're just jamming out to whatever, you know, two those days. and you feel amazing about yourself. What is that amazingness about you? Tell me. 
Say it out loud. I think my, the most amazing thing about me is my, the responsibility I take for my energy. I am real. It is who, it is my superpower. It is how I am. Like, if you meet me like this on a podcast, we're going to click off the air and I'm not going to turn into a weird person that, you know, I use sometimes interview people. And yeah. then you're like, wait, you were so high vibe. And now what the fuck? Where'd you just yeah. go? Right. Yeah. Like I am who I am, but my energy, I think it just, I know how to use it to make people feel really good and mm -hmm. it makes me feel good. So. <laughs> so cute. Okay. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I have a few more. What's something you wish more people knew about you? That I'm actually a very, a big old Friday cat. Um, I wrote a book called fierce, my homeboy, but we create what we need. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I am. Oh my God. I, battle with my fear every single day, all the time. Um, I just, um, talk to it. I now have different conversations. With say it out loud. You say, I it, out say loud. it out loud, babe. I do. And so I just, I've, I've figured out how to reframe it, but I think people assume that I am like, you know, superwoman and made of steel and super confident and not afraid of everything. And that's not the case. I'm afraid of all the things, which is why I'm really good at fighting fear. Cause I've got a lot of experience. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm scared all the time. I'm scared all the time, but I do it anyway. Did you find this? So I just submitted my manuscript June 1st. Did you find that when you were writing your book, your book was forcing you to embody your teaching even more? Yes. Like I A wrote, role model. Yeah. Like yeah. one of my one of my chapters is transform your narrative out loud. Transform your story out loud. And I was so stuck on that chapter because I realized I was there was a particular narrative that was running my life that I was not willing to transform yes. like a so like, I just was curious to know like when you were writing your book did you notice that that it forced you to embody your your teachings even yeah, more for yeah for sure for sure and even as a you know as the, the the beacon of of my work like absolutely I think we all hold that beautiful responsibility to be a, a role model uh to the other women and men uh that are are watching us mm -hmm. and I think that's an awesome honor to take because people are watching. So go show people what it looks like to be brave and also go show people what it looks like to be scared because then they can realize like, oh yeah, I can be scared and still live to talk about it and I can still prevail. So I think um, it's a dance between the two, but yeah. Okay. How do you love to be loved? Well, I am very much an act. My love language is acts of service. So that's how I like to receive love. So basically in a nutshell, that means when you get shit done, I am super happy. If you are all like punctual, you fill up my tank with gas, you fix the project, you, you know, you just, and all of that makes me feel in control and safe and taken care of. I give love through, um, I love to give gifts. So that's how I give love. But I'm like, I, I love, um, when things happen, I love when, um, you know, things are made easy for me or things are, are, are sort of, um, taken care of just handle. Hand yes. Cause I'm such a control freak. So when yes. someone else can jump in and help me out, it's just the best. Cause I, I, I need to be better about asking for help. So. Okay. And, uh, what do you want to encourage my audience to say more of out loud? Yes. And yes. And of course. Yep. So it. yes is not enough and it, and you will find your way through a door that will lead you to your next yes. And once you do that, watch out. And last question, what would you, oh, and I want to, I want to say this real quick. I want my audience, especially if you're in business and you're marketing yourself, or even if you're working in a nine to five, I want you to shamelessly self-promote. I want you to ask for the sale target and, and all these other companies were, were like are constantly advertising to us. Why should we not be selling every day? Like if it's fun for you, do it. Like I love marketing every single day. Why am I not like, you know, so I, I just, I, that's why I like to plug my guests like multiple times throughout the show. Cause it's like, we're the, the, this pays our bill, what we bills, what we love to do is our livelihood and it, it pays our bills and it also helps others. So my last question is, what would you love to shamelessly self-promote today on the Say It Out Loud podcast? <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, I would say if you like listening to this badass podcast, come on over to the Yes And podcast, my podcast. If you if you love the vibe here, you're going to love my show. I think between the two of us, you're going to have your bases covered if you're listening oh, to you. us too. Uh, my book, Fear is My Homeboy, is um, you know changing a lot of lives. And it's three years old and hundreds of thousands of copies sold. And we're just continuing um, to start a little movement with that book. And then my House of And mentorship. Oh, my God. Um, we actually, I don't know when this will air. When will this air? This will air, uh, in pr probably first week of August, August. Okay. Yeah. So I won't say this part chip, chip, chop mm -hmm. this part out or mm -hmm. just leave it in. But mm -hmm. we have a house of man mentorship and, uh, you know, we, we have seven months left to, or what, six months left in the year. So what we're, we're running it through December. If you want to finish 2022 strong and use the ideas and this framework that I just shared, we did a little bit, mini live coaching here on the air. Mm -hmm. We talk about those ideas every month and just help you move shit forward. So, um, we'll link up in the show notes to the mentorship, but I think those are the places in Instagram. You know, just come hang out with me, get to know the brand and um, come listen to the podcast. And I just want everyone to hear, you know, you're, you're, as my dad always says, when you roll in the mud with pigs, you get up smelling like shit. So you want to <laughs> surround yourself with people. Like if you are drawn to Judy's energy and her vibe and just what she's saying, check out her mentorship community is the most important thing. Who you surround yeah. yourself will literally make or break you. So you want to find people who can help guide you, who have been there, who've done that, who you can feel their heart, you can feel their soul. And Judy, you're wonderful. And so if this, so if you. this thank you. If this episode resonates with you, please check out Judy's mentorship. We'll put everything in the show notes. Um, Judy, is there anything left unsaid inside of you that you want to say out loud? No, man, you are the best. Thank you for having me. I love the energy, love your story, and just really honored to be here with your badass audience. And, you know, thanks for giving me a little space this Thursday afternoon to say motherfucker about five times. I needed that. Well, oh, well, I just, I think I need it. I, I think you listen. It. Listen, I'm wearing a long ass maxi pad. I'm bleeding. You needed to say, <laughs> motherfucker. Maxi pads and motherfuckers. I mean, we're gonna either gain followers, or yeah, lose followers, followers. But the ones we gain are the OGs. Yes, so I'm chasing anyway. That's who I want around anyway. Thank you so much for coming on the Say It Out Loud podcast. I, I, I truly admire and respect you. Thank you so much. Back at you. Bye.